Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture, chapter 7, part 1. So in this chapter, we will be talking about the axial skeleton. That is the skeleton that runs along your midline. This includes the skull with its 8 cranial bones and 14 facial bones. It includes the hyoid bone found in the throat, the vertebral column, and the thoracic bones, the sternum and the 24 ribs. While technically the six auditory ossicles are also found in the axial skeleton, we will be discussing those in a later unit. So looking at the skull, you can see there's quite a few bones. This picture is nice in that it makes each bone have its own color, so you can see the difference between the frontal bone and the parietal bones, the sphenoid sort of in back, the two maxilla, and so forth. We're going to talk about all of these bones in this chapter. So one key thing to note is the sutures that run along the skull. And these are basically immovable joints between the cranial bones. So there are four main sutures. You have the sagittal suture that runs along the midline of the skull. You have the coronal suture that separates the frontal bone from the parietal bones. You have the squamous suture that separates the temporal bones from the parietal bones. And then in back, you have the lambdoid suture that separates the occipital bone from the sagittal uh, parietal bones. In an infant, you would not see these sutures. Instead, you'd see areas that are still uh, cartilage because infants are born while their skulls are not fully developed, aka still a little soft. This helps in the birthing process. And so, Instead, you see these areas where there is going yet to be some intramembranous ossification. And these are called fontanelles. So, now you know. The skull has quite a few cavities within it. You have the cranial cavity, where the brain's kept, the two orbital cavities, the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, and a number of paranasal sinuses. Looking into the um, cranial cavity, you actually see that there are what are called cranial foci, which are basically three shelves that different parts of the brain rest upon. So you have the anterior cranial fossa, where the frontal uh, part of the brain rests. You have the middle cranial fossa, where the uh, temporal lobe of the brain rests. And then you have the posterior cranial fossa, where the cerebellum rests. And here's just another picture of those foci looking down into a open skull. Anterior in front, middle, and posterior. Now, the orbit cavities, it turns out, are formed of a union of seven bones. So seven bones surround our eyeballs. You have the roof of the uh, orbital cavity, which is formed by the frontal bone quite clearly, and also part of the sphenoid bone. The lateral wall here is formed of the zygomatic bone and, again, part of the sphenoid bone. The floor is composed of the zygomatic bone, the maxilla bone, and right here you see is a little bit of the palatine bone. And then the medial wall is composed of the maxilla bone, the uh, lacrimal bone, the ethmoid bone, and some of the sphenoid bone. So seven bones form the orbital cavity. The nasal cavity is also composed of quite a few bones. Um, one structure key to the nasal cavity is the wall in the middle that breaks the cavity up into two separate uh, nasal cavities. And that's referred to as the nasal septum. And this is composed of the vomer bone, and the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, as well as the septal cartilage itself. Now, other parts of the nasal cavity are composed of a variety of familiar-sounding bones. So the roof of the nasal cavity is formed by the sphenoid bone and by the ethmoid bone, by the frontal bone, and also by the nasal bone. Each lateral wall is composed of the ethmoid bone, as well as the inferior nasal concha, the maxilla, 
the palatine bone, a bit of the nasal bone, a bit of the lacrimal bone, and some of the sphenoid bone again. And then finally, the floor of the nasal cavity is formed by the palatine bone and the maxilla bone. You may find in your search online that other sources cite a different selection of bones for the nasal cavity. Uh, apparently, there isn't complete agreement as to exactly which bones form the nasal cavity. This is the one that I felt was the most complete. Parasinuses. So within the frontal bone, the ethmoid bone, and the sphenoid bone, as well as the maxillary bones, you have some sinuses, some open spaces in the skull that act as a resonating chamber and allow the skull to increase in size without actually getting heavier. And as we know, when we get sick, these can fill up with mucus. And you know that they drain into the nasal cavity. So, as you can see, there are openings that lead to the frontal sinuses, that lead to the um, sphenoid sinus, that lead to the ethmoid sinuses, and the maxillary sinuses. And there's also an opening that is called the nasolacrimal duct. And that allows tears to go from your eyes into your nasal cavity, which is why when you cry, you often get a runny nose. And all of these sinuses and the nasal cavity itself is lined with a mucous membrane, so it's moist and soft. Now, a cleft palate is a birth uh, defect that can occur where the maxillary and palatine bones fail to fuse together. So you have this gap. And this can cause serious complications because it makes it difficult to talk, a little more difficult to breathe, and obviously when you eat, you're going to be getting food up into your nasal cavity, which is just not a good thing. However, fortunately, with surgery in our modern world, this can be corrected so in picture A here is an infant with a cleft palate. Picture B is that same infant a few years and a few surgeries later. And then finally, the infant as a teenage boy. And he looks pretty much normal at this point. All right, back to the skull. Now I'm going to go on over some of the surface features of some of the bones in the skull. We'll start with the frontal bone. This bone forms the forehead as well as most of the anterior cranial fossa, the shelf that the frontal lobe of the brain rests on. Some other surface marks important for the frontal bone is the frontal squamous, this big thickened portion of the frontal bone. If you're going to smash someone's face with your forehead, you would be hitting them with your frontal squama. Then there's uh, inferior to that, <coughs> is the glabella. That's basically the space in between your eyebrows. And right under the eyebrows, you would find the supercellary arch, one on each side, which is just a little bit thickened. Uh, inferior to that is the supraorbital margin, basically the edge of the frontal bone as it is forming the orbit. Within the, or on the supraorbital margin, there could be a supraorbital foramen, or a superorbital notch. Some people have one, some people have the other, some people have neither. This is part of the beautiful diversity of the human race. And then the part of the roof of the orbit that the frontal bone forms is referred to as the orbital part. We have two parietal bones. They are directly posterior to the frontal bone. Then the occipital bone is inferior to the parietal bones and also posterior to the frontal bones. Not frontal, parietal, sorry. Um, the occipital bone has a number of features. If you take the top of the skull off and look down, you see that the uh, occipital bone forms the bulk of the posterior cranial fossa. It also has two important holes. You have the jugular foramen, one on each side where the jugular vein passes through. It's sort of an irregular shaped hole. And then inferior to that, you have the hypoglossal canal, which you can sort of barely see. And, and that passage allows uh, the, a nerve to pass through. You also see on the back of the uh, occipital bone is a groove. This is called the groove for the transverse dural sinus. It turns out the word sinus can also be used to describe a particular kind of vein. On the outside of the occipital bone, you can see the external occipital protuberance. And a line runs down for that. I'm sorry, a crest runs down for that. 
referred to as the external occipital crest. That crest goes all the way down to the foramen magnum, one of the largest foramen in the skeleton. And that's where the spinal cord goes through. Running perpendicular to the external occipital crest, but also going through the external occipital protuberance, is the superior nuchal line. Inferior to that, but running perpendicular to the crest, is the inferior nuchal line. And then finally, uh, part of the magnum foramen is surrounded by the occipital condyle. There are two of these. They are smooth, rounded protuberances that are articulating with the very first of the vertebrae of the vertebral column. And that's this portion of the lecture.